It is known as the Nobel Prize of the computer world. It's called the Turing Award, named after Alan Turing. You've certainly heard of that name, perhaps seen the movie about the man himself. He created the Turing Test, which determines when artificial intelligence is working in a way that is indistinguishable from human thought. That's the backdrop. But you may not have heard of the prize. It is most prestigious, as you might guess, and every year it's awarded to the best in the field of advanced computer scientists. This time, for the first time, there are two Canadians who have won the prize and who are sharing the prize money, which is a $1 million U.S. check. And I have two of the three winners here, the two Canadians. What an honor. Uh, in studio with me, I have Professor Jeffrey Hinton, who's chief scientific advisor at the Vector Institute. But the profile goes long beyond that. Emeritus professor at U of T, chief uh, engineering fellow at Google as well, vice president there. Welcome to you. Wonderful to see you. you. And in San Francisco, I have Yashua Bengio, who is the director of Quebec's Artificial Intelligence Institute and a professor at the Université de Montréal. Uh, welcome to you, professor, there in San Francisco. And congratulations, Hi. gentlemen, both. This is wonderful. Professor Bengio, let me start with you. I'm wondering, forget the left brain analytical response. I want right brain emotion here. What was your reaction when you found out you had won this most prestigious prize? Uh, I mean, it was such an emotion and I couldn't believe it. Um, it's an honor for us, but it's an honor for the whole field that we've been working towards. It's, uh, I really felt this was a, an amazing moment. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Oops. You're in the airport. We should probably clarify. We're going to get some, uh, who knows, computer-generated voices or things joining us in our interview. But anyway, so big excitement on Professor Bengio's part and understandable. Help us understand, Professor Hinton, in simple terms for us non-scientists, what exactly have you developed? So normally if you want a computer to do something, you tell it exactly what to do. You write a program that tells it in detail what to do. Right. Um, what we've been working on for the last 40 years or so <laughs> is making something more like a brain where you have a bunch of simple processing elements like the brain cells and they have connections between them and the system learns to do things by being given examples and what it does inside is just change the strength of the connections like the brain does. Wow, so this is not me saying, you know, programming something, this is what you do. This is, you call them neural... Networks. Neural networks. This yes. is neural learning like the neurons in our brain. Yes. And you've been working on this for 40 years. In those early days, I mean, people would have thought you were probably a little off your rocker maybe a little bit 40 years ago. Yes. For a long time, people thought this stuff would never work. They thought it was a kind of romantic fantasy that you could take a big neural network and just train it from examples and it would learn everything. But it's not, in fact. It is not fantasy. It is uh, coming to the fore. And we have some examples. And Professor Bengio, stay with me, because I'm going to begin with one of the things that, um, that is really in, in Professor Hinton's area of expertise. I've been noticing on my Gmail exchanges of late. Let's pull this up on the computer. I write a note. Look at these bottom things. Somebody writes a note, and then instead of my having to even write, is this the computer suggesting what I should be responding? So what's happened is the computer can see how other people responded to Gmails and it can understand the relation between the Gmail you got and the Gmails other people have got, even though they're not identical, and it can figure out what's probably an appropriate response. So this is an example of a, precisely what you have come up with. This and is this a neural is... net that's looking at the words in the Gmail uh -huh. and inside the neural net there's neurons getting active and it's predicting what kind of response you might want to make. So I might want to click on it. It's doing the thinking and the writing for me. Uh, Professor Bengio, you're in the area of language as well, and we have some, some video here. This is applied in the area of translation as well. Explain that part, if you would. Yes, of course. So this is not something we expected just a few years ago, that a neural network could take a sequence of words, which was just a bunch of symbols, um, that don't have an intrinsic meaning by themselves and uh, going through all of the computations that uh, Dr. Hinton talked about with a large neural network could produce another sequence of words that would correspond to a translation say from a sentence in French to a sentence in English and what's interesting is that uh, they're, they're doing all this and at the same time capturing some of the meaning of the word so that words that have similar meaning and similar grammatical role 
will end up being represented in a similar way. And that allows those systems to get the right answer in new sentences that they have never seen before. And that's why these things have been deployed, for example, in Google Translate and uh, most industrial uh, translation systems. And we're seeing but the some same video. technology is, is being used for all kinds of natural language understanding tasks. Okay, this is video that Google's provided, so we're seeing it in terms of how they are depicting that. If we want to even look at further application, Professor Hinton, how does this work for healthcare, for example? So there's going to be massive applications in healthcare. Anytime you need to interpret what's in an image, like a CAT scan or an X-ray, at present that's done by people, and people differ from one another and they, their attention lapses. Mm -hmm. um, computers are already as good as people at quite a few of those things and they're getting better all the time. So pretty soon what's going to happen is the doctor is going to consult with a computer um, to agree on an interpretation of an image. Isn't because that... computers can see a lot more images than a doctor can in their lifetime. That's incredible. And again, we're looking at video just to illustrate exactly what you're talking about. So you have helped us develop this. A and as I listen to you, particularly in the healthcare piece, I mean, you see the potential, obviously, but Professor Bengio, you can immediately re recognize why people have anxieties about this, why people are concerned about where the future is going to lead, not just working with, but replacing, perhaps, in so many aspects of our, our life, our society, our economy. We're talking a lot about people's worries about AI and robotics. How do you answer them? Professor Bengio? Well, so I think there needs to be a uh, democratic discussion about how we want to use this technology. It could be used for good, uh, for example, in, in healthcare and in, in many other areas, for example, in transportation with self driving cars, but it may also have a negative impact, as you said, on jobs. And governments needs to, need to start thinking about this right now because it takes time to uh, adapt our, say, training systems or uh, uh, social safety net. But there are also uh, concerns about the misuse of the technology. And, and for that, again, governments need to think about regulations and laws that would be appropriate to handle that, including international regulations, such as uh, how to manage the use of these uh, technologies in weapons, like uh, these killer drones that, mm -hmm. that are worrisome for many of us. Absolutely. I mean, there's even an institute, the Future of Life Institute, Elon Musk is involved in that, trying to make sure that we use all of the technologies that people like you are developing, but for beneficial ends in uh, humanity, not for exactly some of those worrisome uh, things that, y that you have just signaled. You know, you see, governments need to look at this because um, it takes time to come up with a response. Time is something they may not have. This is advancing very, very quickly now. You said you've been in this business for decades, but now it seems that it's moving almost at light speed. What does the future look like for you, Professor Hinton? So I think this new technology of being able to get computers to do things by just showing them examples is going to be used in more or less every industry. Anytime you have data and you want to predict things, you show the computer examples of the historical data and what happened next, and the computer can figure out the regularities and can start making predictions. So, for example, it can predict um, floods. It can predict aftershocks of earthquakes. It can even look at an image of the back of your eye, and by seeing the blood vessels in your retina, it can predict whether you're going to have a heart attack. It's going to happen everywhere, and it's going to... In every aspect in of our life. every aspect, and it's going to increase productivity everywhere. The issue is, will that increase in productivity translate to the general good? But that's a political question. That's not a question about the technology. Because, I mean, it's interesting that you raise this, and I don't know if either of you want to, to, to chime in on this because uh, we'll have to leave it there, but it's a question for policymakers. It's interesting. There is a company I was just reading about that developed a fantastic technology but actually decided not to release it because it was concerned about its uh, application in broader society. I mean... Are you saying that it's just up to scientists like yourselves to develop whatever you can? We have to decide what the limitations are. No, I think the scientists should be very well aware of what they're developing. I think, for example, they might choose not to work on weapons um, because the, the bad uses are so obvious. Um, but the increase in productivity that you'll get in industries in general, that's something that should be for the general good. Um, of course, some jobs will be lost, but many other jobs will be enhanced. Um, so if you look at the printing press, the printing press basically got rid of scribes. But I don't think anybody would say we shouldn't have introduced the printing press. 
we'll see for the future. What a pleasure to meet you both, and congratulations. I, this conversation could go on uh, ad, uh, ad in, to infinity because I think there's so many aspects of this that we're going to have to address as a society. But congratulations to you there in San Francisco, Professor Bengio. Safe travels wherever you're headed next. Thank you for the time, and Professor Hinton. A pleasure to meet you as well. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thanks very much.